So in our lab here at Boston University, we are focused on using engineering approaches to enhance our antibiotic arsenal. The reason we're really committed to this is that we're facing a public health crisis. The number of antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria have dramatically growing over the past few decades. In prior years, it was primarily limited to hospitals. In fact, worst place to be when you're sick is a hospital because you have a great risk of getting a hospital acquired infection. Now, unfortunately, these bugs are moving out into our communities. They're in childcare centers, they're in gyms, they're in schools, they're all over the place. And this growing crisis is unfortunately coupled with a diminishing pipeline of antibiotics being developed by biotech and pharmaceutical companies. And the reason is that economically it doesn't make sense for these companies to develop them. It's about a $20 billion market worldwide that gets narrowly sliced up. Typically, we'll just take antibiotics for about a two-week course. There are a number of generics. And in fairness to the companies, they're focusing on chronic conditions, such as cancer, diabetes, metabolic disorders, wherein you would have to take a drug for a very long period of time. And as a result, with both the increased resistance, diminished pipeline, we could be in trouble. We're beginning to think about this as to, instead of trying to find new antibiotics, can we use engineering approaches to come up with new insights to enhance our existing pool of antibiotics. And what we've developed in our lab are systems biology tools that enable us to firstly reconstruct gene networks inside an organism of interest. So let's focus on, say, E. coli or another bacterium. Once we have that network model, which would tell you not only which gene is talking to which gene, but what's the strength of the interaction and the nature of the interaction, we can use that as a filter to study the response of a bug to a given drug to identify not only what the drug is hitting, but how's the bug responding to that drug. A few years ago, we used this approach to look at antibiotics. And we looked at three major classes of antibiotics. This would include quinolones, such as Cipro, which are known to damage DNA gyrase. And the thought was they damage DNA gyrase, you block replication, the cell dies. We looked also at beta-lactams, which include penicillin. These are known to inhibit cell wall synthesis. The thought is you inhibit that essential function, the cell dies. We also looked at aminoglycosides like tobramycin, gentamicin. They inhibit protein synthesis. The thought was as a result of that in essential function being inhibited, the cells die. We came in and said, well, what would our systems analysis show? And we showed that they were all hitting their known targets and resulting in significant damage that contributed to cell death, but that they also were triggering an oxidative stress inside the bug and that the oxidative stress in the former reactive oxygen species was contributing substantially to the resulting cell death. It wasn't, in it wasn't in place of this other set of pathways, but it was in addition to. And as bioengineers, we then sat back and said, okay, if all of the bugs, all of the antibiotics are producing oxidative stress as part of the killing mechanism, could we, for example, block the defense mechanisms of the cells to oxidative stress as a way to improve the killing efficacy of the bugs? of the drugs. When we did that, when we, for example, blocked the DNA damage response, because an oxidative stress will damage DNA, proteins, and lipids, we found that we could boost the killing efficacy of these different classes from tenfold to a thousandfold. We then went further and actually set up screens to see could we find small molecules that could inhibit such. And we've identified a small number that in fact give us that boost. We can get up to a thousandfold increased killing efficacy of these different classes of drugs with these very small molecules. Well, we then went further and thought, could we engineer bacteriophage? These are viruses that specifically and only infect bacteria, wherein could we have them overexpress a protein that could also come in and serve to sit on these defense mechanisms? And when we did that, we found that we could actually boost the killing efficacy of the antibiotics from now 100-fold to 10,000-fold. Further we found that we could resensitize resistant strains with these engineered bacteriophage to the antibiotic to which they had grown resistant. So say you now have a, an E. coli that's resistant to Cipro. We showed that in combination with these bacteriophage, you could actually, in this case now, make that clinical level of Cipro to which the bug had grown resistant now susceptible to that level and now effective at killing the bug. We went and actually demonstrated this in mice, and when we published this work a few years ago, we actually got immediately contacted by the U.S. Army and Walter Reed Medical Institute. And they shared with us that U.S. soldiers coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan have very nasty skin wounds that are troubled by resistant bacterial infections, specifically eosinobacteria.
And Tim Liu, my star student who's a professor at MIT now, is working along with them with input from our lab as to how we can engineer bacteriophage to help the medical personnel at Walter Reed Medical Institute to actually boost the killing efficacy of our existing antibiotics. Well, we went further and then said, OK, instead of shifting the goalpost of weakening the bug's defense mechanism against oxidative stress, could we shift the other goalposts? Could we use engineering approaches to boost the amount of reactive oxygen species, an oxidizing agent, an oxidant, inside the bug as a means to then improve the killing efficacy of the drugs? And so what we did was we modeled the metabolic network inside the bug. We used mathematical modeling. And we analyzed what happens if we inhibit the different genes linked to that. Which ones, when inhibited, would increase flux through certain pathways that would boost the level of the reactive oxygen species, what I'll call ROS. Well, we identified a number of such targets. And we went in and experimentally tested them and had an 80 to 90% match between our predictions of those which, when inhibited, should boost ROS and those when uh, we said, if you didn't inhibit, you wouldn't see change, which is a remarkably high match for systems biology analyses. Well, we then went in and tested several of these and showed that when you inhibited them, we could actually not only boost the killing efficacy of the antibiotics from tenfold to hundredfold, we could boost the killing efficacy of biocides like bleach, like hydrogen peroxide, like metadione, up to a thousandfold. Well, you're not going to knock out a gene as part of a therapy, you're going to give a small molecule. And we actually found a small molecule inhibitor that's already available for one of the uh, targets that we identified and validated. And we showed with that that you could substantially improve the killing efficacy of biocides, the type you might use to wash your hands, as well as antibiotics, the type you might take if you have an infection. We're now looking to see, we did this initially for E. coli. The beauty of this approach is that it can be readily extended to other organisms that have been sequenced or modeled. Bernard Paulson, my colleague at UCSD, for example, has done genome scale metabolic models for many, many different bacterial species. With those, we can supplement them with a number of different, several hundred reactions to account for ROS and extend it. So we're looking to extend this to staph. We're looking to extend it to pseudomonas, which underlie many pneumococcal uh, lung infections. We're looking to extend this to TB, really with the hope that these engineering approaches, which can be relatively cheap to perform, could provide us with means and new insights to boost the e efficacy and the killing abilities of our existing antibiotics. Now, you can take a step back, which we did, and say, well, the ROS will serve to kill at very high levels. What happens if you have very low levels where they're not killing? Could they cause damage that would be problematic? Well, it turns out they do. We actually did a study to show that very low amounts of antibiotics will still produce these ROS or reactive oxygen species and still serve to damage DNA, but not enough to kill the cell. But the damaged DNA will now lead to mutations. So we've discovered that low amounts of antibiotics can serve as active reactive mutagens, leading to increased rates of resistance. That is, the mutation rate gets bumped up. And why it's important is that we generally think of resistance as arising from a, a few key ones. One is that you either just by chance have a mutation in the target that gets selected for and the bug grows, or they're sharing plasma with resistance strains. Our results regarding our means to try to boost the efficacy points to that the situation is more problematic than we thought. And that is that the antibiotics themselves could be a real part of the problem by boosting the mutation rate. And thus, what we have here is a microbial version of that which does not kill you only makes you stronger. And it points to that where you have low amounts of antibiotics either for antimicrobial washes, which we have now around our homes, whether you're taking an antibiotic course that you don't complete, or whether you're taking an antibiotic course that is really you're getting for a cold that's not a bacterial infection, or most critically, in the agricultural business where farmers are regularly using low amounts of antibiotics as a prophylactic to enhance the growth of their, uh, the animals they have, their livestock. Well, it's serving potentially to substantially boost the resistance inside those bugs, uh, which then could potentially be transmitted to humans, making our battle against these bugs that much more problematic. And so this really points to the need to really pull back on the way we're using these antibiotics and calling for new and better ways to engineer more effective antibiotics. So I, I think some of, the, some of the big obstacles in this field is how do you design agents that have only very minimal 
uh, propensity to develop resistance. Anytime we're going to come up with new agents, these bugs are pretty clever at coming up with new protective defense means against them. And that's our biggest challenge, is how do we overcome resistance for any new agent? We've seen that in some cases certain uh, new compounds have uh, a very long window before resistance arises, but increasingly that window seems to be narrowing. We think engineering approaches can be used to go after this, and specifically by shifting towards combination therapies. By hitting the bug in multiple different ways, we are confident that we can thwart the development of resistance. The second big challenge related to that is actually not scientific, it's, it's societal and regulatory, and that is how do you convince the regulatory agencies to accept combination therapies for uh, bacterial infections. While they have it readily now for HIV treatments and readily for cancer, it's not picked up with the exception of TB for bacterial treatments, and yet I think in order to address this issue of resistance, we're really going to have to go after uh, uh, these infections with multiple combinations. I, I think we have enough data to begin to uh, make substantially more progress than we have. I think we need to bring in additional perspectives and approaches, including engineering, additional chemical, biological chemical. I think we need more data. More data is going to make it easier for us and more insightful. I think we need more data to better understand how the bug responds. I think we need more data to better understand how the bugs inside our bodies respond to antibiotic treatment, which is a major area of interest around microbiome, the notion that our bodies are made up of 10 to 100 times more bacterial cells than mammalian cells, and an increased recognition that these bacteria play a big role in our health and disease. I think we need to better understand how those bugs are working together with each other. And three, I think we need to better understand how you are different from me and how the, the, the viewers are different from each other. And I think the, the personal aspects, I think, play a big role. I may not respond as well to antibiotics as somebody else watching the show. And, and the more data we can have to identify that I am a, a good person for that antibiotic or you're a good individual for this other antibiotic will, I think, go a long ways to minimizing the side effects and more effectively going after these nasty infections. And, and I think that, that general statement applies to other diseases as well.